the 27th chapter, it's the 15th through the 18th verse, and it reads, Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah. For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about embracing Barabbas over Jesus. You know, life is a series of decisions, some easy, some of them are difficult. And sometimes it's hard to make a choice between the options that are presented. But whatever we choose when those moments present themselves, we have to remember that our choices are our ultimate responsibility. And they will be what defines us. Eleanor Roosevelt says, one philosophy is not best expressed in words, it's expressed in the choices one makes. So in the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. And the process occurs over and over until we leave this world. So I want you to think today about the decisions that were made in our scripture. One was Judas's decision to, to betray Christ. Second was Pilate's decision to allow the crowd to decide Jesus' fate. And last, the crowd's decision to embrace Barabbas over Jesus. Think about the choices that they made on that day. And so the title of our message today could have easily have been Embracing Sin Over Salvation. It could have been Deception Over Truth or even Wrong Over Right. So we have a crowd of people in our scripture today who are making some critical decisions. Jesus is about to be arrested. And so the chief priests have sent this large crowd of people armed with swords and clubs to arrest Jesus. And Judas, one of the disciples, is a part of the scheme. And he agrees to help the elders and the priests identify Jesus through a kiss so that Jesus can be arrested. And as Jesus is being arrested, he looks into the faces in the crowd. And he asks the question, he says, am I leading a rebellion that you come out with your swords and your clubs to capture me? He says, every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But then he says, but this has all taken place that the writing of the prophets may be fulfilled. So Jesus is not so much protesting the fact that he's being arrested, but he's protesting the manner of the, of the arrest. All these people with these clubs and these swords as if he was a dangerous criminal. And you think about that in the context of when we get a little bit later and we talk about the rabbis who was a dangerous criminal. He's protesting the hypocrisy in the moment. And so shortly thereafter, we see in the scripture that Jesus is placed on trial. And we have a tendency to go straight to the cross. But Jesus, on that night, had no less than six trials. Three before the Jewish officials, and three before the Roman officials. A preliminary hearing before Ananias, the former high priest. And then they took him to Siaphas, who was the real, ruling high priest and the Sanhedrin, which was made up of the priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law. So the people who put Jesus on trial were the religious people, right? And then again before the Sanhedrin so that they could make a final ruling uh, regarding Jesus. And after they finished, they then took him over to Pilate, and then to Herod, and then back to Pilate before they crucified him. 
So in Mark, the 14th chapter, the 53rd verse through the 15th chapter, which is the 15th verse, they take Jesus over to Siathas, the high priest. And during that trial, it becomes clear that all throughout the night, there were religious leaders who were willing to put their finger on the scale to ensure the outcome that they was looking for, and that was to kill Jesus. You know, several years ago, there was this newspaper covering uh, of a painting by Norman Rockwell that showed a woman buying this Thanksgiving Day turkey. And the turkey was on the scale, and the picture showed the butcher standing behind the counter and the female customer watching him weigh in her turkey. And both the butcher and the customer had these really pleased looks on their faces. But at a quick glance, you couldn't see anything unusual. But what Rockwell had us zero in on was their hands. The butcher was pressing down on the scale, and the woman was pushing up on the scale with her fingers. And if you had called them thieves in the moment, both of them would have been offended. But neither one of them saw anything wrong with the little deception. In the situation with Jesus, the elders and the priests had their thumb on the scale. And they didn't see anything wrong with putting their fingers on the scale. And if you call them dishonest, I think they would have been offended, though they were. They were looking for evidence to kill Jesus. And when they couldn't find what they were looking for, they encouraged witnesses to make it up. And so there were witnesses who came forward to testify against Jesus. They testified that he said that he would destroy the man-made temple and build it again in three days. Not, uh, and so what they did is they misstated what Jesus said in John the second chapter in the 19th verse. He talked about if they destroyed the temple that he would raise it again in three days, but he was talking about his body. But in the face of all the false testimony and all of the accusations, Jesus was silent. He fulfilled the portion of the scripture that says, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, but he never said a word. The question that he answered was from Siaphas, are you the Christ? the son of the blessed one. And Jesus said to him, I am. And the Jewish authorities thought that that was sufficient to conclude that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy. And that's when they began to spit on him and blindfold him and hit him with their fists. And then they took him over to Pilate for the civil trial in order to condemn him for treason because blasphemy wouldn't have got him crucified but treason would. And so when the Jewish officials got Jesus to Pilate, the first question he asked them was, what charges are you bringing? Very simple question, what charges are you bringing? They really didn't have an answer. And they responded, if he weren't a criminal, we would not have handed him over. And so Pilate said, well, take him back. And you judge him by your own laws. But they couldn't do it. Without a Roman charge and without a Roman trial, there was nothing they could do. Without the trial, they couldn't get to the crucifixion. And when they insisted, Pilate began questioning Jesus. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, yes, it is as you say. And the chief priests and the elders began to make accusations. And again, Jesus stood quiet. He gave no answer. And Pilate said to him, don't you hear the testimony? they're bringing against you? Do you understand the testimony they're bringing against you? And Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge. And as I think about Jesus being silent in, a, in the face of accusations and um, misstatements, there are times in our lives that we have to be content as well to allow the Lord to fight our battle. It reminds me of a story of this really contentious board meeting where there were some very harsh things that had been said by the people in the room. And one of the men who was highly respected and um, unusually wise in his judgment had said nothing throughout, th throughout the entire discussion. And suddenly one of the men in the arguments turned to him and said, you, you haven't said a word. I'm sure we'd all like to hear your opinion in this matter. He responded, I've discovered 
that there are times when silence is an opinion. And I'm sure in those moments, Jesus was before Cephas and Pilate that Jesus's silence spoke loudly. He refused to defend himself. In those moments, I think Jesus was focused on the task at hand. Once he had made a petition to God to take the cup from him and ended that exchange and said, not my will, but let your will be done, Jesus was then focused on the moment. And in fact, he said in Mark, Mark 14, uh, the 41st through the 42nd verse, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Everything that could have been said and that needed to be said had been said. And so the moment for doubt and changing course was behind Jesus. That's why he wasn't saying anything. He said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But it's not. My kingdom is from another place. And hearing what he's heard and knowing what he knows, Pilate is at a crossroads. He now has a decision to make. Pilate knows that Jesus is not guilty of what he's accused. He finds, the scripture says, Pilate says, I find no fault in him. And our scripture today, verse 18 says, for he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. And so the people had a decision to make. They heard Jesus' preaching. They'd observed the miracles. They'd experienced his presence. And they had a decision to make on that day. It's just as we have decisions to make every day. Either, every day we either choose Jesus or we choose Barabbas, right? And the real question is, who will you choose? So who is Barabbas? Barabbas is this rebel, and he's a prisoner. And he's been put in jail for robbery and for murder. The word I use is notorious. Barabbas was notorious. He was well known for his lawlessness, whether it's because of the nature of his crimes or because he was from a crime family. Treason, murder, and felony robbery were notorious crime, and Barabbas was guilty of all three. He should have died for his crimes, and he knew that, and he was expecting that. He was expecting all of the torture that came with those crimes. But as our scripture said, there was a custom every year that in an act of goodwill that Pilate would release one prisoner. And I think Pilate thought that was his way out of making a decision with respect to Christ's destiny that day. He couldn't find fault against Jesus. The evidence was conflicting. And so Pilate offers to release Jesus to the crowd. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked him, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? I think Pilate was stunned that their response was, he released Barabbas over Jesus. He was amazed that they would embrace a murderer over the Savior. It wasn't so much that they embraced Barabbas, is it? It really is more important than we see it for what it really was. It was a rejection of Christ. It wasn't so much embracing Barabbas as it was that they rejected Christ. And when we reject something or someone, we refuse to accept or even consider them. In fact, we exercise our right to choose something else. And that's what the crowd did that night. And so did Pilate. I think about it like gazing at a box of open chocolate candies. We stand there with our lips pressed together, our eyes open wide, concentrating on this really tough decision at hand. We know the rules. We can only choose one. Right? We can't have both. We can only choose one, no more than one. You get to choose what you want, and that choice 
is what we have every day. Should we choose the biggest piece of candy in the box, or do we choose the small round peppermint cream? Which lasts longer? Which is better? Which one should we choose? How do we decide? William Law says that if we've not chosen the kingdom of God first, in the end, it really makes no difference what we choose instead. I'm going to say that again. He says that if we don't choose the kingdom of God first, in the end, it really makes no difference what we've chosen instead. Because placing him first in our lives should be our daily goal. They should be our main pursuit in the midst of all pursuit. And so we recognize the importance of the decision that Pilate puts before the crowd. I think Pilate realizes how important it is, and it's really about having the right perspective and eternal perspective, because that's what we need every day in order to make the choices and decisions that come before us. We need an eternal perspective. And in everything that we do, we have to choose Christ first. The scripture says that we seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and this righteousness and all these things that and all these things will be added unto you. Everything we do, whatever we do, 1 Corinthians 10 and 31 says we do it for the glory of God. So when we have a choice placed before us in terms of choosing Barabbas or choosing Christ, we choose the glory of God. We choose to put off what we want to gain in order to get to what we need. We choose obedience in difficult circumstances over the easy circumstances. We choose honesty even when we know it'll hurt us. We choose compassion over unkindness. We choose humility over pride. We choose patience. And we choose uh, generosity over selfishness. Who do you want me to release? Do you want me to release Barabbas? Or do you want me to release Jesus? Even Barabbas knew he deserved to be crucified. Can you imagine what he thought when he heard through the bars of his prison cell the soldiers marching to come and get him? Can you imagine how confused he must have been when he heard the guards say, Barabbas, you're free to go. Someone else has been selected to die in your place. And so the question is, it's really about, are we choosing Christ today, or are we like the crowd? Are we rejecting Jesus? Are we making the tough decisions, or are we taking the easy way out? The second point today is that being neutral isn't an option. See, Pilate had the biggest decision of his life before him, and he made it. He, did, he didn't want to make that decision. What could be worse? than not having the courage to choose Christ in that moment. He had the power to do it. I don't think he had the courage to do it. It was about him. It was about his career. He wasn't popular with the Jews, and he wasn't about to make a decision that was going to make him even more unpopular with them. But with, with regard to our faith, we can't straddle the fence. We can't be neutral when it comes to Christ. We have to choose loudly, and we have to choose him boldly. We can't straddle that fence. Revelation 3, the third chapter, the 15th through the 16th verse says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That means that God rejects us when we're lukewarm and we try to straddle the fence. You know, think about it. When you put your food in the microwave, you put it in the microwave for a purpose. You start it on a few seconds and you taste the food. If it's still lukewarm, you put it back in the microwave. That's what you do, right? The goal is to have it hot. Scripture says that we can't be lukewarm when it comes to choosing Christ or he'll spew us out of his mouth. So Paul, Pilate puts the decision to the crowd, even though he doesn't agree with the decision. And then he tries to wash his hands of the situation. It says, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, 
but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. So those of us who are in positions of power have to, the responsibility to make a tough decision. Pilate felt found no fault, but made no decision. He decided to do nothing. And when you have a choice to make and you don't make it, that in and of itself is a choice. James 1 and 8 says that a double-minded double -minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When we talk about being double-minded, we talk about trying to serve two masters. And that's what Pilate was trying to do that day. When you talk about serving two masters, the scripture says in Matthew 6 and 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. So Pilate is trying to preserve an already tenuous relationship with the Jews. And so he allows that to influence his decision. He listens to the crowd. He listens to the priests and the elders. And he chose to please the crowd instead of Jesus. It's important that we make the right choices so that we don't have the eternal regret that perhaps Pilate had. Has. The decisions determines our destiny. We can choose righteousness over wickedness. We can choose sinfulness over holiness, or we can choose light over darkness. Whatever we choose, we have to know that we have to make a choice, that we cannot straddle the fence and be neutral. And the last point is that our choices have consequences. There's a scripture that says, choose ye this day who you will serve. The, Christ, the crowd made a choice that day. And they said when Pilate washed his hands, his blood be on us and on our children. And the goal here was to indemnify Pilate for any guilt he might be suffering. They offered to take on a debt that they could not pay. They said that Christ's blood was on them and on their children. They agreed to take the punishment of sin upon themselves and their children. And the scripture says that Pilate released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Thank God that when Jesus chose to die on the cross, he did it for all who believe. And that includes Barabbas, the crowd, the chief priests, the elders, and anyone else who accepted him as Lord and Savior. He did not hold a grudge. But he died for all on the cross. You know, during the war between Britain and France, the men were drafted into the French army and by a kind of lottery system. And when your name was drawn, you had to go out to battle. And there was one exception to it. You could be exempt if somebody else willingly took your place and went to battle in your place. And so when the authorities came to one young man, they told him that he had been chosen and he refused to go. He says, I was shot two years ago. And at first they thought he was crazy, they said, but he insisted. He claimed that the military records would show that he had been drafted two years early and earlier and he had been killed in action. And they were like, how can that be? You're alive. I'm talking to you right now. And he explained that when his name came up, a close friend of his said to him, you have a large family, but I'm not married and no one's dependent on me. I'll take your name and your address and I'll go in your place. That's the principle of substitution, which is at the heart of the gospel and is at the heart of the work that Christ did on the cross. Jesus willingly took our place, not because he had any little thing less to lose than we did, but because of his infinite love, he died in our place and he paid the penalty for our sin. And the law that demands the ultimate punishment, which is death, has no claim because Jesus died thousands of years ago. He finished the work, which is the basis of our salvation, and we depend on him because he is our substitute. Amen. As I close today, I encourage you to embrace Christ today in everything that you do and in everything that you are. Put aside your Barabbas, whoever that, whatever that is or whoever it is, that may cause you to reject Christ and embrace them. Choose Christ over your Barabbas. 
He calls us into a loving relationship and into commitment. And because he loved us so much, we can't waffle and straddle the fence, but we have to choose him every day because our choice has eternal consequences. If there's anyone here today who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've not experienced the, the salvation that he made available to us by dying a substitutionary death, today is the day. All you have to do is ask him to forgive you of your sins and come into your life and be Lord of your life. Is there anyone 